So this is really an important disease, as we'll see. And we're going to talk about berberine. And I'm really excited about berberine. So you'll see that berberine is like ivermectin. It's truly a nature's gift to us. It's a truly astonishing molecule. So we're going to talk about metabolic syndrome, which is really important because about 30% of Americans have it. Many don't even know they have it. So we're going to talk about metabolic syndrome, what it is and how to treat it. Obviously, we have no conflicts of interest. We're not selling anything and we're not selling any products. And just as a proviso, a caution is that, that, you know, diabetes and the management of diabetes should always be under the supervision of healthcare provider. And you shouldn't be unilaterally changing your medications if you were diabetic without consulting your clinician. And you'll see why. So this is diabetes in red, the number of people in the world. And you can see the enormous population. And here's the number of obese people. This is currently where we're sitting. You can see that the number of obese people is like 400 billion and projected to increase to 700 billion. So obesity and type 2 diabetes is going to become one of the major medical problems that we are facing. And as you'll see, there's a strong correlation between obesity particularly central abdominal obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. So what is metabolic syndrome? And it's really important because this is really common and people need to know what it is. So basically, it's defined by a number of features. So the first is a fat belly, waistline over 40 inches in men and 35 in women. So if you walk towards the wall and your belly hits the wall before your face, you have a big belly. So hypertension, increased blood pressure, a fasting blood glucose. And we're going to come to this because we're going to talk about diabetes and the metabolic syndrome, which is raised blood glucose. So a fasting blood glucose over 100, a fasting triglyceride over 150, and an HDL cholesterol, which is low, less than 40 in men and 50 in women. So these five features make up the metabolic syndrome. And as I said, over 30% of American adults have the syndrome, which increases your risk of cardiovascular events, stroke, cancer, and early death. So how do you test for insulin resistance? So this becomes important when you go for your annual checkup and you need to speak with your physician. So the first one is, as we said, a fasting blood glucose. So that's after an eight hour fast, if you have increased blood glucose, so normal blood glucose is between 70 and 100. If it's over 126 on two occasions, you are diabetic. The next, which is really an important test, is hemoglobin A1C. And this test is a readily available test, and you can even get it, do it at home. And this basically gives you an indication of your average blood glucose level as to over the last two or three months. So it's kind of gives you the average. So the normal hemoglobin A1C is between four and 5.6. If you, it's between 5.7 and 6.4, it's indicative of pre-diabetes. If it's over 6.5, you have diabetes. So you can see diabetes is increased blood glucose, increased hemoglobin A1C. And as you'll see with the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, you get a high triglyceride, a high triglyceride of greater than 150 uh, is an important predictor of insulin resistance. And then people are obsessed by the total cholesterol, but actually the total cholesterol actually is not important in terms of predictor of cardiac events. The most important predictor is the ratio of triglyceride to HDL. So a high triglyceride is bad, a low HDL is bad, so you don't want a ratio of more than two to one. So it's really important that most people should undergo these screening tests to see if they have prediabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, or diabetes. So we're going to talk about how to treat the metabolic syndrome, how to treat prediabetes and diabetes. And so we're going to come back to intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. This is the only physiological way to eat. 
And the normal way we eat causes profound insulin resistance. And this should be combined with a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet. We're going to talk about berberine, which is truly an astonishing molecule. And this is the dose between 1,000 and 1,500 milligrams a day, taken uh, two or three times. Metformin has been used, as we'll see, for the last 60 years for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, is considered the drug of first choice. Metformin and berberine actually are being investigated as anti-aging drugs to prolong health span, to allow people to live healthier, longer lives. Melatonin actually is really important. It's been shown to improve insulin resistance on its own. Magnesium is important for the release of insulin and insulin action, resveratrol. Cinnamon actually acts very similar to berberine, has many of the similar mechanism of action. And many times berberine is actually combined with cinnamon. But as we'll see, berberine is significantly more effective in terms of blood glucose control. In fact, after intermittent fasting, berberine is probably the single most important intervention to control blood glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and insulin resistance. Omega-3 fatty acids are important because it's been shown that supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids significantly reduces the risk of dying of cardiac events, having an MI, and cardiovascular complications. Probiotics with bifidobacterium always you know, reduce stress and anxiety and light form of exercise. So we need to talk about what not to eat. So most Americans' diet is made up of these things. So these are high carbohydrate processed foods, which cause a high blood glucose. They all have a high glycemic index and they cause a fatty liver. This is basically the cause of insulin resistance, prediabetes, and diabetes. This, what you're seeing on the screen, donuts, bagels and bread, cookies and muffins, fries, juices, fruit juices, potatoes, rice and pasta, chips. So these are things you do not want to eat that will cause high blood glucose, sustained hyperglycemia. The glucose then gets converted to fat in the liver, causes a fatty liver. And the fatty liver is probably the underlying central mechanism which causes insulin resistance. So if this is what you're doing, you want to stop. You want to stop doing this because this is by sure the best way to shorten your life and you're going to get all kinds of complications. However, this is what you want to eat. Your vegetables, particularly coniferous vegetables, leafy vegetables, avocado is really so good. You want to eat fish, particularly salmon. Meat is fine. You want to eat nuts, chicken breast. You want to eat eggs. Eggs is fine. There's nothing wrong with eggs. Eggs is perfectly fine. It's probably one of the the most important nutrients. And this whole cholesterol egg thing is a complete and utter hoax. So there's nothing wrong with eggs. Grapefruit and berries actually are very good fruits because they have a low glycemic index. So these are the things you want to eat. And this is together with intermittent fasting. This is how you can control your blood glucose, control your obesity, control your triglyceride, and prevent this whole metabolic syndrome. So we're going to talk a little bit about berberine, which... I discovered recently, and I must tell you, berberine and ivermectin fall into the same category. They're most astonishing drugs. They have multiple modes of action, and they gift to us from nature. So this is not made in a pharma- by a pharmaceutical company, and you can't patent it. So that's why nobody is interested in this remarkable, astonishing Chinese herb, which has been used for thousands of years. Because you can't patent it and sell it, no one's interested. You agree, Dr. Mabin? Absolutely. And I have a question for you. How did you find Burberry? <laughs> it's a long story, actually. <laughs> and I tell you the truth. My sister asked me, hey, because my sister insulin resistance, and she has a high triglyceride, and she was doing research, and she said, have you heard about Burberry? And I said, Berber what? Berber what? So I looked, started reading up about berberine and oh my goodness, it's an astonishing thing. It's a gift to nature. So berberine actually regulates blood glucose, as we'll see, by many mechanisms. It lowers blood glucose, it alters lipid metabolism, it increases insulin release from the pancreas, it decreases 
It increases fatty acid oxidation in the liver, so it decreases fatty liver. So you can see that this drug attacks all the aspects of the metabolic syndrome, glucose control, lipid control. It completely reverses metabolic syndrome. In addition, as Dr. Berg said, it has really some other potent, it's potent anti-inflammatory, it has antiviral effects. It actually enhances the effects of exercise. So if you exercise, it potentiates exercise, unlike metformin, it modulates the microbiota. So this is truly an astonishing compound. And it's found in many plants, in roots and leaves, and it's a natural herb. So this is Dr. Bean's famous graphic, and we may come back to it, but basically it's very complicated. But to make it simple, you can see he's labeled it one, two, three, four, five. And basically this is the insulin and insulin receptor, and this is the glucose transporter. So basically berberine acts via multiple, multiple mechanisms by increasing glycolysis, decreasing gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the liver making glucose. And clearly, if you already have high blood glucose, you don't want to make more. As we said, it decreases lipid production in the liver, decreases lipogenesis. And most astonishingly, it acts on the pancreas, beta cell of the pancreas, to cause insulin release only when the glucose is high, which is very smart because you don't want it to cause insulin release with a low glucose. So it's really important. Berberine doesn't cause hypoglycemia because it only increases insulin release when glucose is high. And I, I love this one aspect of it, that you can actually take berberine with this safety that if your glucose is low, it is not going to further lower it. Yes, it's right? very important. That's why it's such a safe compound. And it alters, you can see it affects the liver is the cause of type 2 diabetes, whereas the pancreas is the cause of type 1. Type 2 diabetes is really a disease of fatty liver. And so it centrally acts on the liver. It's a truly astonishing um, molecule. So we should talk about metformin because it is being used for the last 60 years. It's, it's considered the first line treatment for type 2 diabetes. It has many actions similar to berberine, decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis, i.e. the liver making glucose, decreases absorption, it lowers insulin, increases Ill insulin sensitivity. And much like uh, berberine, it's anti-aging, anti-tumor, cardiovascular, using polycystic. So the benefits of metformin and berberine are very similar. But if you actually compare them head to head, berberine actually may be a little bit more effective in its effect on hemoglobin A1c. What is interesting, Dr. Bean and I discovered today, is that actually if you're an exerciser, you do a lot of aerobic exercise, metformin may actually reduce the benefits of aerobic exercise, whereas berberine actually augments it. So if you are an athlete doing aerobic exercise, you want to take berberine rather than metformin. And that was an astonishing discovery and such an important one as well, because we all should be exercising. And then if somebody is taking metformin and exercising, their exercises benefits reduce. On the other hand, with berberine, these benefits augment. That's a huge difference. And then, so I suppose we not only talk about cinnamon, I really wasn't that interested in cinnamon, but Christina and Dr. Veron were absolutely insistent we look at cinnamon. So actually, it's also, again, another Chinese herb used for thousands of years. It's used for the treatment of fever, common cold inflammation, and it has a whole host of activities. Many of these herbs are truly astonishing, antiviral, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetes, antioxidant, cardioprotective. It lowers glucose. So much like berberine, it does lower blood glucose, but it doesn't seem to be as effective. It's not as potent as berberine, but what actually it may have a role when it's used in combination with berberine. So there are sub, some supplements that actually combine cinnamon and berberine. So thanks, uh, Christina. So I will just give you what happened to me. So as we said, you know, you want a fasting blood glucose less than 100. This is my profile yesterday on after being on berberine for a week, a week of berberine. So I used to run blood glucoses 110, 120. You can see what's now happened. This is my profile over the whole day. It com stays completely flat. It's a flat blood glucose profile. This, 
This, this is, is astonishing. Yeah. So don't forget, I was a diabetic. I was having glucoses up here. And with each meal, they would spike up to 200. Look, it's a truly astonishing thing. It's and did astonishing. you have a meal during this time? I had, yes, I had two meals. Here we go. Really? Completely flat. No, this is flat. No peak. It's a little bit high here because actually I was really annoyed. I had an argument with a friend. So this <laughs> causes glucose to go up a little bit. So you can see it was a little bit high, but still it's in the normal range. So it's truly astonishing what berberine has done to my blood glucose profile. I think this drug is magic. magic. And I wanted to ask a question then. During your time, so is it one week or two weeks? I've been on it for about 10 days. Any side effects? No, absolutely none. So we'll come to the side effects. So berberine in some people can cause flatulence or diarrhea, but it actually goes away with time. And those are the side effects. So, I mean, it's truly astonishing if you consider the toxicity. I mean, people can die from an aspirin. People can die from a Tylenol. This drug, or the only recorded side effects are in some people, a bit of flatulence that's like farting, making, you know, lots of GI air or some diarrhea, but it's very self-limiting. So I had no problems taking berberine. You know that your glucose levels are better than my glucose levels and I'm not diabetic. Yeah. So isn't that amazing? This is my blood glucose. It runs in the eighties and this is, I used to be a diabetic. I had a high hemoglobin A1C. I was on two or three diabetic medications. So I was kind of cured with intermittent fasting and the other stuff, but berberine has just blown it out of the ballpark. It's truly astonishing. It's an amazing thing. So we will talk about it a little bit more. Um, What I do want to tell folks about is I'm really excited to announce or people know we have our next conference. Dr. Bean will be there. Dr. Bean will be talking about some metabolic stuff. I'll be talking about intermittent fasting. So we want to remind you about our conference, April 28, 29 in Fort Worth, Texas. It's going to be fantastic, like like our previous conference. So excited to be there. Yeah, that was my little introduction to berberine, which Dr. Bean did a really good Dr. Bean show, went through all the mechanism of action of berberine. I mean, it's truly astonishing. You know, we like ivermectin because ivermectin is this pleiotropic drug that has so many different modes of action. And in terms of viral, has lots of antiviral. Berberine's the same. It's a truly astonishing drug because it's you know, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-aging, but most importantly, it basically treats the metabolic syndrome. So the likelihood is, you know, one in three or one in four people watching tonight have the metabolic syndrome, and you don't won't know about it until you test it for it. The only outward sign is if you have a big fat belly, because if you have a big fat belly, it means you have lots of abdominal fat. If you have abdominal fat, you have fat in your liver. If you have fat in your liver, you have metabolic syndrome. So, you know, the only obvious sign is if you have a big fat belly, but people need to be tested for it because it increases your risk of cardiovascular events, stroke, cancer, insulin resistance causes cancer because, you know, hyperinsulinemia, it causes premature aging. It causes Alzheimer's disease. So, Correct. you know, if you can control metabolic syndrome, you can basically live a long, happy life. Yeah. And I wanted to add one more thing that the insulin resistance and the cancers. So what happens is, I mean, one of the mechanisms is that as the insulin resistance develops, even immune systems cells do not get enough energy. They do not make enough ATP. They do not have correct glucose metabolism. The result is that immune system cells are not working correctly. So they cannot actually handle infections and cancers. Yeah. So, you know, part of metabolic syndrome, I mean, by definition, is actually insulin resistance is that. So what happens is that normally insulin drives glucose into the cell. What happens with insulin resistance is the insulin, it becomes less effective. So in order to compensate, the pancreas makes more and more insulin to try and compensate. What eventually happens is you have a hyperinsulin state. You're hyperinsulinemic and you're insulin resistant. It's really the high insulin, which is together with the fatty liver, which drives all the complications. It causes heart disease and atherosclerosis. So it's, you know, people think it's high cholesterol. 
That's complete nonsense. It's not high cholesterol. It's the high insulin and the inflammation, which goes together with the high insulin. So the high insulin is what's driving you know, coronary disease. It's what's driving diabetes, metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer. So that's why, I mean, it's really important to manage it. It's really Absolutely. insulin resistance is a disease of modern lifestyle. It's Absolutely. from because of the way people eat and the way they, their lifestyle. So I have a couple of questions. One was, do you think that fatty liver in general can also be helped by berberine? And the second question was, do you think that type 1 diabetes can be helped by berberine? What do you think? Yeah, so those are both really good questions. So most patients with fatty liver have fatty liver because of diabetes, pre-diabetes. But obviously, you can also get fatty liver from alcoholic liver disease. So alcoholics, before they get cirrhosis, have a fatty liver. So, you know, it's called non-alcoholic steatohepatosis is the other fatty liver. So yes, you know, berberine decreases, it increases fatty oxidation, it decreases lipogenesis. So it will definitely help. In fact, it's one of the treatments for fatty liver. Surprisingly, the other treatment for fatty liver is ivermectin. So ivermectin actually has a really important role in the treatment of fatty liver. So many people have this complete bogus idea that ivermectin is toxic to the liver. You know, this is the FDA's disinformation. In fact, it's used to treat fatty liver. The question of type 1 diabetes is really important. And so what we're talking today is type 2 diabetes. So in type 2 diabetes, you have high insulin levels because you have insulin resistance and the insulin is not working. The problem with type 1 diabetes is the pancreas gets damaged and the pancreas is actually not making insulin. So it's a very different story. So that intermittent fasting can be quite dangerous in patients with type 1 diabetes. The question is, would berberine work in a type 1 diabetic? And so it's a good question. I would say yes. I think it would have some beneficial effects. It may increase pancreatic secretion. It obviously does have really important effects on lipid metabolism, which is abnormal in diabetics. And it may uh, improve glucose receptor function. So we know one of the effects of berberine is not only does it cause insulin release, but it actually increases expression of the insulin receptor. So that makes insulin more effective. So Absolutely. what that means is that a type 1 diabetic who needs insulin actually may need a lower dose because the insulin now becomes more effective. Correct. So. You know, there's not, there, there aren't really good studies that I know of, maybe you, you do on type 1 diabetes, but I would say it certainly can't be harm. I don't see any harm and it likely is of benefit. What, what do you think? Absolutely. And I uh, maybe I can just use my diagram. It's time to have the superpowers of Dr. Bean. So if we go here for a second to this diagram, this is what you were just talking about. For type 1 or 2, one important aspect of the berberine is that increases the insulin receptors. And imagine that this is an insulin receptor and there are many of them. That means even, so imagine if there were all of these insulin molecules and there is just one receptor, then there is a specific amount of reaction. But if there are too many receptors and there would be a lot more reaction. So that would really help type one or type two. And secondly, I think that when the pancreas in type one becomes dependent on insulin, meaning our body becomes dependent because pancreas is not able to release a lot of insulin. Maybe at that time, berberine can help a little bit, but it would not be able to compensate for the lack of insulin that is happening. So that means external insulin would still be needed. Yes. So, you know, while berberine may actually, as I've, you know, a good example, it has really together with a diet and metformin has cured my diabetes. You know, type one is really, is not a, that we know of a curable disease, but you can control it so that your insulin requirements may become less. So, you know, I, I think that it would cause better control of a type one diabetic. Absolutely. And if you give me another one second with my diagram, I want to show you something else as well. So this is a point that you made and 
I really appreciated yesterday or day before when you and I were speaking and you made this statement that type 1 is the disease of the pancreas and type 2 is the disease of the liver. So again, that doesn't mean that it is the liver that is itself just generally sick and that is the diabetes, but liver is a main contributory factor. And what I was astonished with when I was drawing these, all the mechanism of berberine in one place, that berberine has a very interesting hepato curative or liver healing effect. So if you see here, what happens is in the liver, for example, when insulin comes in, that causes this AKT to become active. Eventually, this enzyme here called SREBP1 and 2, but here we're using just SREBP1 because berberine works on it. This enzyme causes another enzyme called fatty acid synthase that helps make fatty acids. It increases that enzyme, eventually leading to lots of lipids and fatty acids being formed in the liver, which then starts accumulating in the liver and liver's own function start becoming disrupted. And now we have a fatty liver and we have a problem. Look at this, how berberine behaves. Berberine causes SREBP1C to be downregulated, to be suppressed, resulting in less lipid production. And when the less lipid production is happening, the hepatic steatosis reduces fatty acid synthesis, reduces fatty liver starts reducing, liver starts improving. So it's not just that, all right, we have less fats in the liver, so all good, liver is healthy. Actually, when liver is healthy, liver is performing better. So when the liver cells become better, they start controlling blood sugar better and the hyperglycemia starts reducing. So this, I feel, is a long-term effect of berberine, that it starts improving the liver, which would keep the glucose at a lower level, control hyperglycemia, and that's a long-term outcome. I really am astonished by this mechanism. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at type 1 diabetics, and that's not the focus, but if so berberine has any inflammatory, any oxidant and immune modulating properties. So in that respect, it actually may help because we know that type 1 diabetes is due to autoimmune disease of the beta cells of the pancreas with destruction. Unfortunately, once it manifests, many of the cells have already been damaged, but it may, I mean, it is possible, it, it may improve pancreatic function. And I think that if the beta cells have not be, become too much destroyed yet, I think it would definitely improve it. So if somebody has not yet become insulin dependent, I think, and there are no studies, this is me conjecturing, I think it would delay the conversion to type 1 because it would improve the sensitivity, it, it would improve the glucose uptakes, and it would improve the insulin secretion. 